We think 2024 will be better for lithium, but as we stated in past videos, these are the most cyclical of the cyclical stocks. Interest rates, especially in North America and Europe, are hitting consumers very hard, and that's making financing a new car more difficult. But make no mistake, EVs are a significant percentage of new cars sold, and it's still very much on the rise. Welcome back to Chipstock Investor. Today, we're going to be focusing on the energy sector, and we're going to be talking about next-gen fuels and hydrogen products in this episode. We have a few companies that we are shareholders of, Albemarle, Air Products and Chemicals, and Berkshire Hathaway. And to start this off, I'm going to ask you, Nick, why do we focus on companies like this versus a more traditional energy company that focuses on oil and fossil fuels. Common question that we get, Casey, among other reasons, here's the simplest answer. Let's take a look at the Vanguard Energy ETF, VDE, over the last decade or two. That's the reason why, okay? It's pretty simple. This is no longer a secular growth industry. Integrated oil and energy companies overall, yes, they are making a pivot to some renewable energy. Let's just call it, like you said, Casey, next-gen fuels, uh, next-gen energy. The need for these things are not going away, but it's no longer a growth industry. The secular growth trend is gone, and most estimates point towards, by the end of this decade, actually a gradual decline in global demand for traditional fossil fuels and integrated oil will start to settle in. So it's like uh, this roller coaster whenever you invest in an industry where, you know, cash flows and dividends are the primary investment thesis. You end up with this roller coaster. And if you don't get the timing right in those cycles, you kind of end up in the same station you launched from on the roller coaster. Uh, as far as the dividends go, you look at some of these oil majors yielding 4%, 5% dividend yield. I think we'd buy a bond, Casey, a high quality corporate bond or government bond now yielding about 5% before we'd buy one of these oil and energy stocks with more price volatility, we think, going forward. Yeah, I think that is a simple answer. It's just not, has historically not been that great in the long term, more of a sideways move. So why are we talking about Berkshire Hathaway Energy and Air Products and Chemicals? Both of these companies are spending tons of cash right now, especially Air Products is going through a massive CapEx spending spree and we have been dollar cost averaging into this stock for a while now with a goal of making it around 2% of our portfolio. But Nick, this sounds very familiar to me with this CapEx spending. Isn't Texas Instruments also doing the same thing, spending tons of cash in CapEx in order to expand their manufacturing output? And I do remember that we said we were not buying Texas Instruments for that very same reason. Why do we feel comfortable? in purchasing air products versus Texas instruments. Yeah, it sounds hypocritical, right? Hypocrisy much. And yes, it is, Casey. We are buying air products and chemicals, ticker symbol APD, for the very reason we're avoiding Texas instruments. Uh, so Casey, I think this is where maybe it becomes important to briefly recap our investment process, our top-down approach. So the energy industry, the air products, participates in is capital intensive across the board. Uh, Air Products is not the only company undergoing this current CapEx spending spree right now. We see very little way around that as these companies retool to address future energy needs and also address this desire to clean up operations, whatever you want to call it, renewable energy, meet ESG goals, whatever. CapEx is needed from all of these businesses to pull that off. By contrast, the semiconductor industry, which we talk about all the time, has largely disaggregated itself into different parts of the supply chain. So Texas Instruments, primarily a manufacturer, obviously that's one of, if not the most capital intensive part of the industry. And in contrast, you can actually invest in other companies that are focused in more asset light parts of the industry. For example, uh, a fabulous chip designer, basically an engineering firm with zero manufacturing, or you could invest in a software-based semiconductor play like Synopsys or Cadence Design. 
So there are other alternatives to Texas Instruments and its CapEx spending spree at the time being. In contrast, we see very little way around the CapEx spending spree in the energy sector. So thus the seeming hypocrisy. Yes, we like air products for the same reason that we dislike Texas Instruments. Before continuing, let me remind you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if this video is helpful as you do your own investment research and increase your knowledge of business and technology. We really appreciate the support as subscribing to the channel helps us continue putting out content like this. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Nick. And there's not a lot of options when it comes to betting on natural gas, hydrogen, and industrial gases. Lindy is one alternative that has already went through a big CapEx boom, but APD is a bigger play on specifically natural gas and hydrogen versus more industrial gases at Lindy. And that's one of the reasons why we like air products. Let's move on to Berkshire Hathaway Energy Sector. In their earnings report, they had a big increase in energy and utility revenue, but the segment operating income decreased down to less than a third of where it was last year. What's up with that, Nick? Oh, I love this question, Casey. And uh, you're not going to see this anywhere in the media because these are accounting issues. Super exciting topic to discuss in a video. Uh, let's not get off into the weeds too much, though, right? That's a different video that we'll call Warren Buffett's financial reconciliation. Uh, literally no one other than maybe some CPAs and some tax pros would click on it. Maybe even they wouldn't because it just sounds awful, right? Yeah, that sounds incredibly boring. I hope you can make this interesting for us. <laughs> okay, I'll try, but no promises, okay? So there were some very significant developments that happened throughout this year that explains this effect. Like you said, big increase, as you show in the tables, Casey, in their energy and utility revenue, but the big fall off in operating profit, most dramatically in the third quarter, right? So the first, I'm going to start with like the least dramatic effect to the most dramatic effect on an accounting basis. So the first, energy prices are down a bit from the last year or two. Uh, and the spread between wholesale energy and retail, uh, it's kind of contracted a bit. The spread between what you can buy energy for on a wholesale basis and then what you eventually retail it for is where you make your profit margin in energy and utilities. Okay. So that spread between those two has narrowed and thus you see a bit of contraction there, not just at BHE, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, but a lot of other energy businesses as well. At the very least, many of these companies flatlining. Okay. Second, Berkshire Hathaway also spending significant amounts of CapEx also like air products and like a lot of other companies to address growing energy needs. Uh, both for the manufacturing sector in the U.S., for example, chip manufacturing in the United States, lots of new fabs getting constructed right now from Texas Instruments, Intel getting ready to do that, Micron, so on and so forth. Also renewable energy goals. So uh, a lot of this is liquid natural gas and supporting pipelines for that. There's a bit of overlap with that with hydrogen. It seems that some of the same infrastructure for li liquid natural gas can also support hydrogen. Berkshire Hathaway Energy, a leader in developing some of that. And then also possibly, Casey, like we talked about in past videos, that really, really nice property in the Southern California desert that might become a lithium mining operation for Berkshire Hathaway. Link to that video in the description and you'll get to see where Casey's favorite beach in the world is. And then maybe the third thing, and this is the most dramatic one, Casey, there were two major acquisitions this year in the Berkshire Hathaway energy segment. Berkshire Energy actually was an equity investor in Pilot and Flying J. If you do road trips, you probably see these things all over the country. So they upped their stake in Pilot and Flying J at the beginning of this year. And so this moved from being an equity investment like Apple and Chevron and Occidental Petroleum and all of those stocks that you often hear as Warren Buffett stocks those are equity investments because Berkshire Hathaway is a minority investor. But with this latest investment at the beginning of 2023 in Pilot Flying J, now Berkshire Hathaway is a majority stakeholder in Pilot Flying J. And so it ceases to be an equity investment and suddenly becomes part of the operations 
of Berkshire Hathaway Energy. So thus the near tripling year over year in revenue for Berkshire Hathaway Energy, but the lower operating profit because now all of that pilot flying J revenue moves over to earnings and income statements at Berkshire Hathaway. There was also a second smaller acquisition just made in September, Cove Point LNG, liquid natural gas, uh, which stores and ships LNG for Maryland, a port in Maryland. Uh, this was also a minority equity investment before they upped their stake. It's now a majority held business by Berkshire Hathaway. So it ceases to become an equity investment and it moves also to the income statement at Berkshire Hathaway. And of course, whenever there's big acquisitions like this, you have elevated expenses involved. Uh, so as a result, we think these two acquisitions will ultimately result in a big rebound for operating income in the energy and utility business next year. Overall, we still see Berkshire Hathaway as a great stock to start building a portfolio with. It's one of our core stocks that we hold in our portfolio. And we feel like Air Products could become another core holding for us as well. Currently, we are dollar cost averaging into Air Products, but over time, we expect that this will also become a core holding for us. See our most recent tech stock core video about what tech stocks we hold as a part of our core portfolio. Let's move on to our final subject here, Albemarle stock. And this company, again, is one that we've been holding for a while now. It's been a disaster in recent quarters. What is going on? Quick break from chip stock investor Casey, and I wanted to talk to you about Main Street Data. Main Street Data is a data visualization and charting platform that helps investors analyze companies in the stock market. Because the stock market is so complex, it can be very difficult to make informed investment decisions without the right tools. Main Street Data gives you the tools and information you need to make better investment decisions. Main Street Data offers a variety of benefits, including data visualization, charting tools, and company earnings calls transcripts, which are an easy way to reference up-to-date comments from management of your favorite stocks. You can sign up for Main Street Data today and get a special discount through our link below in the description. It's been all over the board, right, Casey? At some point in one of our videos, I think we said uh, doing future projections, especially from one quarter to the next, on where revenue and profits are going to be for this company is a fool's errand. And we've seen that, right? Albemarle Management has updated its financial <laughs> guidance. It seems like every couple of months throughout 2023, right? Yes, they have. It's been a roller coaster ride. So ultimately, Casey, I think let's maybe clarify one thing, and maybe you can do this because you picked this slide out of their presentation deck for Q3 2023. And we touched on this when discussing on semi, a ticker symbol ON, a couple of weeks ago, another EV electric vehicle stock that we are betting on um, as sort of a proxy for the growth of the EV industry overall. Albemarle is one of those companies as well. And maybe a lot of folks are worried that is the EV growth movement, is it like dead on arrival? Is this thing finished? Yeah, check out this slide that Albemarle provided at their earnings call. From 2020 to 2023, the base level of EVs has grown significantly and it's still in an upward trajectory. In 2022, obviously over 10.5 million in production, but we're still in growth mode for EVs. And this is very contrary to many media reports that are trying to make this sound like an EV disaster. This is very overstated, but there are definitely headwinds for the EV market. Interest rates, especially in North America and Europe, are hitting consumers very hard, and that's making financing a new car more difficult. But Make no mistake, EVs are a significant percentage of new cars sold, and it's still very much on the rise. It's simply that the growth is slowing a bit. Yeah, that's a nuanced statement, Casey, that is often misinterpreted. Growth is slowing, not stopping. Okay, that's a great slide. 
So Casey, as far as lithium goes, we've talked about this in our past videos. We said stocks like Albemarle were the most cyclical of cyclical stocks. This is typical for base materials and mining. The stock price looks shocking this year, but really it's not much of a surprise. This happens. It even oil, if you've been around investing long enough, maybe you remember this even happening to oil and energy. Good old fashioned fossil fuels, well entrenched in the global economy, also taking a similar 60, 70% nosedive in 2015 and 2016, when there was like this period of supply and demand imbalance. So this is essentially what's happening with lithium, except that this is a growth cyclical industry. So the volume of lithium sold is still rising. Albemarle is reporting this. That's why they were still able to grow their sales 10% year over year in Q3 despite the price of lithium tanking 50, 60% from all time highs this time last year in 2022. And one benefit Albemarle does have over some of its competitors, as we like to call out and what drew us to investing in this stock in particular, not only is it a leader in selling lithium, but they have those long-term contracts with customers that helps establish a floor and a ceiling for the, the, selling price of their lithium to customers. So pricing pressure still very much having an effect on Albemarle this year, as could be expected, but there is a floor there that we're still not certain that the market is fully appreciating for this company. Nick, as we talk about many times, it's all about the future and the guidance is looking very poor for Q4 for Albemarle. It basically looks like this is going to become a no-profit business. Is that What's going to happen? Yes and no. In the short term, maybe for a couple of quarters, yes. Albemarle is going to go from very, very hefty profit margins to suddenly losses, at least again for the next quarter or two. This should be temporary though. And there's a couple of reasons we believe this is the case and that management helped explain in a bit further detail on the last earnings call. Casey, the first thing is many of Albemarle's battery manufacturing customers, uh, many of them in China have been choosing to buy less new inventory as of late and instead kind of work down some of their existing inventory of lithium products used in manufacturing batteries. This, you can see this, their own, Albemarle's own inventory of lithium on the rise because some of their end customers reducing their own inventory. So that's one, one reason why this situation can't last for forever. These companies can't just simply run out of inventory. Otherwise, they're going to have a very unwieldy business to try to manage. Uh, again, I would say, Casey, doesn't this kind of sound familiar to another situation we cover all the time here on our actual chip stock episodes? Yes, Nick, this does sound very familiar. In the semiconductor industry, there was an excess of chips for especially PCs, smartphones, laptops that had to be worked off over the last year, right? Exactly. And that has now bottomed all of those chip companies that supply inventory for end manufacturers. You know, their revenue is now bottoming Intel, AMD, Qualcomm, all reporting sequential growth again. So again, I think just to reinforce this, when you're talking about cyclical stocks, you have peaks and valleys and it looks like Albemarle is going through a similar cycle. There are some added effects though going on here, Casey, that are similar to the energy industry and fossil fuels. So Albemarle is fully integrated from mine to refine. Okay. So like a lot of integrated oil and energy companies, Albemarle gets a take, let's call it a take rate at every step in that process. You put work into extracting and then refining a product. And as it moves through the value chain, the product gets more valuable to reflect the work that has gone into producing it. Uh, here's the effect though on accounting. Again, super boring stuff. I'm gonna keep it brief and out of the weeds. Albemarle management pointed out that this process can take up to six months from extraction at the mine to actual end refinement and sale to the manufacturer, to the battery manufacturer. And a large chunk of their inventory now is moving through the balance sheet as they refine it. And it's sort of stuck there right now, again, because of other customers managing their own inventory down, conserve cash. And so this is having a temporary effect on profit margins because Albemarle is doing the work, but not has not made the final sale of that product yet. 
to realize the profit. So hopefully this is resolved by sometime in the first half of 2024. Uh, and then the third thing, Casey, this is more shuffling around of assets, maybe sort of similar to the Berkshire Hathaway effect that we just talked about, but Albemarle was restructuring some of their businesses this year, and some of those are now finalized. So they were restructuring a joint venture with mineral resources in Western Australia. Also, it's marble joint venture in West Australia uh, that includes some of its refineries in mainland China. So that's also having a big temporary effect on profitability as well as some cash had to leave the balance sheet to help reconcile those reworkings of the joint ventures. Uh, unrelated, but also probably important, I think, just to mention this briefly, Casey, because we talked about the Lion Town resources acquisition. That ended up being a wild drama that it didn't end happily in some sort of gather happily ever after story. Australia's richest person, Gina Reinhart, got involved with Lion Town. Long story short, it sounds like she was not interested in selling Lion Town to Albemarle. Albemarle walked away from the deal when the economics didn't work in their favor anymore. At the end of the day, we like this. We like their discipline in walking away from a deal that doesn't make sense. We're still very confident in Albemarle management's ability to allocate capital profitably over the long term. So the ultimate question is, is Albemarle stock a buy, especially with all of these nasty growing pains, right? We'd like to think this is the bottom of the lithium cycle, and perhaps it is because the Fed seems to be at least hitting the pause button on interest rate hikes. We think 2024 will be better for lithium, but as we stated in past videos, these are the most cyclical of the cyclical stocks. And if you're at all interested, you need to use a dollar cost averaging plan and keep your final allocation to any raw materials and refining businesses to a low single digit percent of your portfolio at the most, and always try to rebalance along the way. We're targeting 4% of our portfolio towards lithium, including a bit from Berkshire Hathaway over time. Great points. Again, Casey, we've addressed this in past videos. Link to that last one below where we, we dove into Albemarle's business in a bit more depth. Whether you're interested in it as an investment or not, uh, we think lithium is an important part of the raw materials industry to be acquainted with because no, it's not a semiconductor. However, it is a type of new energy, a new base material that helps create that value added distribution of the economy that we addressed a couple videos ago, Casey, about uh, things being infinitely scalable or not. Albemarle, one of those base level energy stocks, helping power the infrastructure, the new infrastructure, semiconductors and chips. So um, do some digging on this one, folks. It's an important industry and we think, yeah, growing pains aside, still a cyclical growth business for the long term, in our view. Okay, that's a wrap on this episode, this energy episode of Chip Stock Investor. We have another energy episode coming up later this week, and it's going to be based on something that Tesla's Elon Musk said about the new lithium refining plant he said would be a license to print money. So will it? We'll discuss that in our upcoming episode as well as Livent stock. Is it out of juice? Stay tuned for that episode and more from Chipstock Investor. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our videos and make sure you have those notifications turned on. We will see you all again very soon at Chipstock Investor.